Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, so what I'll do today is uh, talk about some work that we started a very long time. Actually, when I first entered the Leishmania field, this is what I started doing. So I'm going to show you some data that goes back over 20 years. And then bring you up to where we are now. So just to sort of a, 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 a go through where we started and where we are now. So I, I, the first talk I gave related to the work we're doing in the field, but this is, I also have a laboratory at McGill University, and this is what the work that we're doing in the lab. So, uh, so when I entered the field, the, the, the question we looked at is that you have two stages of the parasite. You have the promastigote stage, which is shown here, and then you have the amastigote stage, which is shown here. And an obvious question is, what's the molecular biology? How does it change from one stage of the parasite to, the, to another stage of the parasite? Are there genes which are expressed here, but not expressed here? If you find genes expressed here specifically, then those are, would have to be required for survival in the human and they could be considered as virulence factors. So we started to look for genes which were specifically expressed here but not here. And this was before the age of microarrays or RNA-seq or anything like that. So I won't go into how we actually isolated the gene, uh, but I'll, I'll show you some of the highlights of it. So if you, the gene we found is called A2. And if you look at promastigotes, you see that the messenger RNA is not expressed. If you have macrophages which are not infected, so uninfected macrophages, the messenger, the messenger is not expressed. But when you infect macrophages with Leishmania, Leishmania turns on this gene. So we could see the expression of this gene turned on here. And if you just grow exenic promastigotes or amastigotes, again, this is at the RNA level this gene is turned on here. So this was the first, probably the first example of a stage-specific gene which is expressed in Leishmania, called the A2, and it's probably still the, uh, one of the best uh, identified genes which is specifically expressed. So you could see the year was published, 1994. I think many of you maybe weren't even born at that time. It <laughs> goes back a long way. So <clears throat> what, what, a, what, what do we know about this? Well, the protein sequence is here, so there's a repeat here. It's 10 amino acids, which is repeated many times. Um, and in fact, there are many of these proteins. Some of them have more repeats than other repeats. So when you do a, a Western blot, you can see that you have many proteins here. And they're all the same, it's just that this one has more repeats than, than the ones down here. So it expresses many of these, uh, of these proteins uh, of different sizes, shown here. And when you look at expression in, in an infected macrophage, this is quite interesting. It's an inducible gene, so it's turned on, but it's not turned on all at the same time. You see some, some amastigotes express high levels of the protein, and some of them express low levels of the protein. So it's, it's an inducible protein. And, and we still don't really understand why some are expressed more than, than others. So it's not all of the amastigotes that turn it on at the same time. And if you look at the genome, you can see that these white boxes are the A2 genes. And you, there are many genes, and that's why you have many bands, and they have different, different size proteins. So you can see that this one would be a, a bigger uh, protein uh, than this one. So, and these are the two chromosomes, and you can see it's a multi-gene family. And this was all done with Leishmania donabani, which was the parasite we were working with at the time. If you look at <coughs> sera from infected people, you can see that uh, gen people do make antibodies against this protein. It's, it's a highly antigenic protein, so you can see an anti-sera here as, as compared to control here. Uh, so this means that it is expressed in when it is inside humans as well, because people are making antibodies against this protein. <clears throat> and when you look at uh, the presence of this gene, this is by separating chromosomes, one of the interesting things is, is that this gene isn't present in all Leishmania species. And generally, it's, it's present in Leishmania donovani, Leishmania infantum, in the old world. It's also present in Leishmania amazoniensis and mexicana, as shown here. But if you look at L. tropica or L. major, they don't have the gene here. This is separating chromosomes. That's why you just have a single band here. So it's not present in all species. And generally, it's not present in the species where you have cutaneous disease. It's more expressed in, 
in parasites that have visceral disease. And you say, well, what about Mexicana? This is a cutaneous parasite. But in fact, Mexicana is related to Amazoniensis in, in, the, in the New World. And Amazoniensis does cause visceral disease in dogs. It's actually a, it has a dog reservoir. And it does, it's a visceral parasite in dogs. In fact, many dogs in, in South America have Leishmania Amazoniensis visceral disease in addition to infant. So it's, it's generally associated with the uh, uh, visceral diseases. So, <clears throat> so at that point, we decided to look at, at this gene in Donovani and see what, what's happening in L major. Why does L major not express this gene? What, why is it not present in L major, which is a cutaneous parasite? And we looked at the gene in L major. In fact, it has the gene, but it lost all of the repeats. You see, these are the repeat units here, uh, 10 amino acid repeats in Leishmania donovani. If you sequence it in L major, it's lost. The, 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 um, the five prime end is here, the three prime end is here. It's actually a leader sequence. And we could find only one repeat, so only one 10 amino acid. So L major had it at one time, and they just got rid of all the repeats. So why, why did L major get rid of it? Why? At some point during evolution, it, 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 it no longer needed the, uh, the A2 gene. Uh, so, so the experiment was then to put back A2 into L major. What would happen? Because L major had it, no longer expressed it. So we put it back into L major to see what would happen. So we tr put in a a plasmid here, these are plasmids expressing A2, so we could turn on A2, but only a single protein, not all of those multiple ones, because we, we, we were using a plasmid expressing a single protein. And in the A mastigotes, it was turned on here, so this is the uh, L major expressing A2. And when you expressed A2, you could get higher levels of infection in the spleen. So you could move L major to get better survival in the liver and spleen. And in fact, uh, it also caused a lot more splenomegalia as well. If you had L major with A2, it induced much more larger spleens than, than control uh, infections as shown here. So this indicates as well that this is one of the proteins which is required for the parasite to survive in visceral organs. Uh, and having a splenomegalia is consistent with what you see quite often in in visceral leishmaniasis where you have this larger spleen and, and perhaps the larger spleen is due at least in part to the expression of this, this protein which is specific to the uh, visceral parasites. Uh, so what else do we know about A2? Well, th this is a, a, an interesting experiment. If you, it, this looks at survival of the cells in culture, uh, Alamar blue, and if, if the if you have a red culture, it means the parasites are alive. If it's blue, it means the parasites are dead. So if you take L major and you culture them at 26 degrees, you see it's red, so they're alive. But if you put them at 40 degrees for two hours, they all die. And if you do the same experiment with Leishmania donovani, which is a, is a visceral parasite, when you switch them for two hours at 40 degrees, they're all alive. So this is one real major difference between donovani and major, is temperature. Donovani can survive at a higher temperature. L major dies at a higher temperature. You can see L major dies here. And when you put A2 into L major, you can see now uh, you're getting more survival at a higher temperature. So it help, A2 helps the parasite survive a higher temperature, which is consistent with visceral disease because you have uh, high fever, uh, which is consistent with visceral disease, and A2 helps uh, uh, survive at, at this higher temperature. So <clears throat> I'll, I'll just summarize what we know about A2 is that A2 is required for survival in higher temperature, which is consistent with fever that you have specifically with, uh, <clears throat> with visceral disease. And I, I'm not showing the data, but it also <coughs> it, it improves the survival in the, in the presence of reactive oxygen species, nitric oxide, and this is what allows the L Donovani to survive in internal organs. Whereas L major lost the A2, and it just no longer is able to survive in visceral organs. Now it, it just survives at the skin, it stays at the skin. So, um, <clears throat> as we move forward, uh, 
over so about 10 or 12 years ago, we started to look at the situation in Sri Lanka. Again, we're always trying to understand why Donavani causes visceral disease and other parasites cause cutaneous disease. And there was this very interesting phenomenon that was occurring in, in, in Sri Lanka uh, where you had cutaneous leishmaniasis, and this is a, a person here with cutaneous leishmaniasis, but this person was infected with Leishmania donovani. Normally, Leishmania donovani goes into the visceral uh, into the visceral organs, but here it stays in the cutaneous organs. Here it stays on the skin. So there's something different about this Leishmania donovani, which now has moved it from a visceral parasite to a cutaneous parasite. And at the time, there was some interest in it, but not a lot of interest, uh, let's say 10 years ago, uh, until we sort of, we didn't call it a cutaneous L. Donovan, we called it an attenuated Leishmania donovan because it no longer kills people, it's no longer a virulent parasite, so it's an attenuated strain. So as soon as you call it an attenuated strain, it tends to get more interest, or much more interest was developed in this, in this parasite. So this is just a picture of Dr. Ranasinga, is the person we've been collaborating with in Sri Lanka, and you can see and, and one of the things, if you look at this area here, this was a study that was done about 10 years ago, and each one of these red dots represents a cutaneous leishmaniasis patient. But in fact, there was also a visceral leishmaniasis patient here. So there was very few numbers of visceral uh, leishmaniasis, and there's a lot of cutaneous leishmaniasis. And at the time, it was thought that it's the same parasite. It's just that usually it causes visceral disease, but in some in some people, usually it causes cutaneous disease, but in some people it causes visceral disease. So we were very fortunate at the time to be able to isolate parasite from the visceral par uh, patient and from a cutaneous patient. So we had parasites from both the visceral disease and the cutaneous disease in an area which was very similar in, in Sri Lanka. So this was the patient here who had visceral leishmaniasis. We isolated the parasite. This is, the, in fact, the, the patient that the uh, cutaneous uh, leishmaniasis where we isolated parasite. And we now had parasites growing in culture between these two, different, uh, these two different individuals, one with a visceral disease, one with a cutaneous disease. So here comes my first question. You've got this parasite here. What would you do with it? What's the first thing you would do with this parasite now? You have your own lab now, and someone gave you these parasites, and you say, okay, so now what, what am I going to do with these parasites? How am I going to study? What would be the first thing you would do with those parasites? Pardon? Genotyping? Genotyping? Yeah. But it's confirmed that they're both Donovani, so let's, let's put the genotyping. Sorry. So what genome sequencing? Genome sequencing, right? All right. So you're not, you're not really... <coughs> You have to think about the biology first before you do the, the sequencing. So the experiment we did was to introduce it into a mouse and see what happens when you introduce it into a mouse. It's, it's a much simpler experiment than sequencing the whole genome at the time. And this was probably one of the more interesting results we had over the many years I've been working on leishmaniasis. When you took the cutaneous parasite and you put it into a mouse, injected it IV, and then one month later looked in the liver and spleen, you found very little parasites, almost no parasites at all. But from the visceral parasite, we had a lot of parasites. Visceral patient, we had a lot of parasites. Uh, so this one was very uh, virulent in the mouse. So this one survives in the visceral organs in the mouse, and this one does not. So biologically, they're different. Okay, so not only are they both Donovani, but biologically they are different. So it's not the same parasite. They're actually two different parasites. One of them can survive in visceral organs. One of them can't survive in visceral organs. Now is the time to sequence the genome, because now you know these are really interesting parasites. If they both had the same phenotype, you would say, well, it's not all that interesting. You know? I mean, let's say they both cause visceral disease. You would think that, yeah, we'll look at the genome, but it's, it may not be all that interesting. But if you have a phenotype, and, if, and, and whenever you're studying a parasite, make sure you understand what the phenotype is, not only what the genotype, but understand what the biology is. So this had a really interesting biology. So uh, this work was, was, was published several years ago. Again, it was in collaboration with Peter Myler, who, 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 who you spent some time with. And I won't go through all of the data. Peter actually presented some of this data in, in his talk. Uh, 
But what we found is that the genomes are very similar between these Donovanic parasites. One causes visceral disease, one causes cutaneous disease, and the, the genomes are actually very similar. In fact, they're more similar to each other than the L. Donovanic genome in India, which is right across the, the right, right next door to uh, Sri Lanka. There were no genes that were lost. We thought there would be a number of genes lost or gained, but in fact, they all had the same genes. Um, what we did find was that some of the genes were amplified more than other genes, but very few, actually. We thought there'd be a lot, but there were very few. And, but we did find SNPs. So one of the things you, 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 you went through yesterday is, how do you identify SNPs, and which SNPs are important? How do you know which, which SNPs are relevant and which SNPs are, are not relevant? So I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So of course, one of the genes we looked at was A2, because we've been interested in A2 for, for a long time. And that was one of the genes that was, in fact, different between these two strains. And this is, again, a, a Peter showed this slide yes, yesterday. There was more A2 expression in the visceral parasite, which had a number of A2 protein. But the cutaneous parasite had lost some of them. And there was now fewer genes in the cutaneous. So it's, it's starting to lose the A2 genes, which is something like L major did. They, they, they lost A2 over time. And that's probably why, or one of the contributions, why it moved from a visceral parasite to a cutaneous parasite. And if you add back a copy of A2, see if there's already three, but you make it four, you actually are able to increase the survival in visceral <coughs> Again, not too surprising. We had already seen that. But in fact, we were able to reproduce this in a, in a more relevant uh, system. Uh, and looking at the SNPs now, I, um, so we got rid of a lot of the SNPs. If, if the SNPs weren't in a coding gene, we, we, we removed that. And if the SNPs didn't change in amino acid sequence, we didn't look at that. And if the SNPs weren't present in all of the parasite, we got rid of that. So we, we narrowed it down to just single nucleotide polymorphisms, which changed an amino acid in a protein. And in fact, we only came up with 72 SNPs out of the whole um, genome, which isn't really a lot. And then we classified those under whether or not those SNPs would have a high impact on the protein or a low impact. Um, and so we, so we have these, and we're starting to look at these in more detail now, but one of them we're quite interested in. It's, it, it, it's a single nucleotide polymorphism in the RAG-C gene. So this is one that we're starting to look at. Uh, more carefully. And you can see that this is this single nucleotide polymorphism here. And these are all reads across the cutaneous strain versus the visceral strain. And you can see that this single uh, nucleotide change is consistent in all of the reads. It's not some of the reads, but all of the reads. And this was one of the criteria that we had to say that this is an important step. So things like this are not too important because it's not consistently all the way down. But this one it was consistently all the way down in this RAG C gene. And, we, and, uh, and, and the other thing is, when you find a SNP like that, what, one of the things that makes it easier, if, if something is known about the protein, and in fact, this RAG C uh, gene is, is part of a pathway which is very well studied in cancer cells. It's the TOR pathway, or the mTOR pathway. And there's a lot of research has been done in this uh, pathway and this is the RAG C here, here. And this protein interacts with another protein called RAG A, and then it activates the TOR pathway. And this is control cell proliferation. So there's a lot of research done in this. So, so you can go back to the literature and look at the cancer literature and try to understand the pathway. And this may help you understand what's actually happening in Lashmania as well. So it's, it's nice to study a protein where there's something quite a lot known about that, that uh, signaling pathway. So uh, one of the things we found is that the, the RAG-C mutant, we call it a mutant because it's changed in the attenuated strain, the mutant does not interact with RAG-A as well as the wild type. So by changing that single amino acid, it no longer interacts with uh, RAG-A uh, as well as, as the wild type. So this pathway seems to have been altered in, in Lashmania, and so we're continuing to study that pathway. So this is one of the ways you could use genomics to identify a pathway, but you have to do wet lab experiments. You have to grow the parasite, you have to label it with an antibody, you have to do the immune precipitations. You cannot just do genomic analysis and make 
determinations about what's a virulence gene and what's not a virulence gene. You've actually got to be able to do the experiments as well. So if you don't have, if you do, if you do a genomic analysis in Leishmania from your country and you identify something you think it's interesting, what you have to do, and you don't have a lab, so what you have to do is identify researchers in North America or Europe that, is, that has wet labs and say, look, I'd like to collaborate with you. I found this interesting gene. Let's collaborate. Let's look at its function. Or if you think you have something interesting, you can contact me, and I could put either I could help you or put you in contact with other people as well. But um, you have to s establish those collaborations to allow you to, to do those types of experiments. Um, so some of the things that we're doing right now <coughs> is uh, some of the other questions we're asking is why. Why has this isolate lost virulence in Sri Lanka? What, what, what is it about Sri Lanka that made this parasite change? In fact, now we're starting to see a cutaneous Donavani in other parts of the world as well, in the northern part of India uh, and uh, Nepal as well. There was a, a, a nice poster from Nepal. So it looks as though this cutaneous Donavani seems to be popping up more and more. So why has, why has it moved from a visceral parasite to a cutaneous parasite? One, one potential reason is, is maybe it's changed its, its reservoir. Normally, Donovan is a human reservoir, but maybe it's switched to an animal reservoir. Maybe it's no longer likes to be in humans, or it's not able to be very effective to be transmitted in humans. Uh, maybe because there's better drugs now, so the parasite figured it's got to get into a better reservoir. So when it moves into an animal reservoir uh, and gets adapted to an animal reservoir, now it's not as efficient when it gets back into a human. So that's something that has to be looked at. Um, does it help us develop a vaccine? So people who have the cutaneous parasite uh, may be protected now against visceral parasites. So you have an immune response. You're in, you have the cutaneous lesion. You have an immune response. The lesion goes away. That immune response may be protecting you against visceral. So this may be some way help you to understand uh, vaccine development. And, uh, and again, understanding this pathway could also provide very useful information about uh, survival of the parasite in visceral organs. And it may, it may help you to identify new drug targets, because there definitely is a need for new and better drugs for lush analysis as well. Maybe if you could turn this pathway off, you could stop the parasite from surviving in visceral organs. Okay, so I'd like to now bring you up to date to what's actually going on uh, in my laboratory right now. And um, this, re this, this relates to gene editing in Leishmania. How can we go in and change the genome of Leishmania? And uh, the new technology, which many of you have probably heard about, is CRISPR. And CRISPR is, 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 um, uh, comes from uh, understanding how bacteria survive in the presence of phage viruses. And, and this, so this is a bacterial cell right here. Um, and when a phage infects a bacteria, it introduces DNA. But the bacteria are very intelligent. They've sort of developed a way of, of killing the phage. And one of the ways that they do that is they take part of this DNA here from the phage, and they put it into its genome here. And then you, from that copy, it expresses a small piece of RNA called the guide RNA, which interacts with a nuclease called Cas. And this guide RNA guides the Cas back into the phage DNA, and it cuts the phage DNA. So it's like an immunity. It, they develop a memory when they've been infected with a phage. They remember it because they've taken a piece of that phage DNA, put it into the genome, and then use that to cut the, uh, the, the phage up upon reinfection. Uh, so this bacterial system, again, this is people studying bacteria and phages, and they think it's got really low relevance, but in fact, once you understand this, you can use this technology to do gene editing in higher eukaryotic cells as well. Uh, so this has really revolutionized uh, the way genes are studied in, in eukaryotic cells. So can we use this for Leishmania? Can we take that Cas, CRISPR-Cas and move it into Leishmania? And so if you have DNA here, so this is a piece of DNA here, and you introduce a guide RNA. This is the guide RNA here, which interacts with the DNA. And this purple is the Cas. Can you use this to cut uh, Leishmania DNA? So we, we, we started to look at that uh, about four or five years ago. Uh, and it turns out that, yes, you can actually cut Leishmania DNA 
uh, by this mechanism. Uh, and the way we did it, this is when we Zhang from my laboratory, is, is he made a plasmid. So this is a plasmid that he constructed. So he took various pieces, put it together into a plasmid. And the plasmid expresses Cas. This is the nuclease that cuts DNA. And the plasmid also has an area here to express guide RNA. So this will guide the RNA uh, so that the Cas knows where to cut it. And it's got some antibiotic resistance genes here so that you can transfect it into Leishmania. He used a promoter, uh, ribosomal RNA promoter. This is a Leishmania ribosomal RNA promoter. And he used a hepatitis delta virus ribozyme to make sure that the guide RNA would be the, the correct size. Um, and so with this plasmid, you can actually now start to edit the genome of Leishmania. So it's quite, qu quite remarkable uh, to be able to put this together to edit the genome. And the way it works is that you have a, a a Leishmania parasite, you have the plasmid that I just showed you, you transfect that plasmid into Leishmania, you do electroporation, and let's say you have this uh, target gene here. Uh, so the guide RNA comes in here, it brings the Cas, and it cuts the DNA, uh, and you cut the DNA from Leishmania. Now, what happens when you cut, the, cut a chromosome? What's the parasite going to do? It has to fix it. If it doesn't fix it, it's going to die. So it has to really uh, develop a way to fix that cut. So when you cut the, the DNA from Leishmania, uh, it, it desperately has to try and fix that, that genome, otherwise the parasite dies. In fact, so that's what happens 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, but one of the ways that you could increase um, the, the, the fi to, to, to repair this chromosome is add a piece of DNA called a donor DNA. And this has homologous sequences at each side. So this donor DNA here is 25 base pairs long. And what it does is it's, you can see it's got a homologous sequence at one end, homologous sequence at the other end. It's like a patch. You put it back, you put it into the Leishmania, and it brings the two pieces together and it fixes it. So you repaired that uh, damaged chromosome. And when you repair it, you could also add anything you want in here. So this purple sequence here, you could add another gene, you could add a GFP, you could add an antibiotic resistant gene, you could add a stop codon, you could add anything you want into this donor patch here. So you fix the chromosome and at the same time you can add anything you want in there. Or you could add nothing. So it really allows you to do whatever you want to do in Leishmania editing the genome. So the technology was developed. Uh, so the question now is what do you do with it? So what, what would be the, if you had now this technology in your lab, what would you want to do with it? So this is something knock else. Out the genome. Pardon? Knock out the genome. Knock out genes, sure. Yeah, you could use it to knock out genes. Okay, let's say we want to use it to knock out genes. What gene would you like to knock out? Which is essential for the survival of the Yeah, yeah, you could do that. So then, but if it's essential, you're just going to kill the parasite. So that's not going to get you very far, right? You, so you, you don't really want to go after essential gene here at this point. Maybe, but you, maybe to add some um, like things. Yeah, but what, what is needed in the field of Leishmania today? When I, when, I, when I talk about what's needed is you need drugs, you need diagnostics, you need surveillance, you need a vaccine, right? So this is what's needed in the field, right? So can you, now, giving you, starting from that question, what would you do with this, with this technology? Changing Yeah, you could change virulence. In fact, yeah, you could do that. So, so what we decided to do very early on is to collaborate with other people who are trying to develop a vaccine. This is something that is really needed in the, in the area of leishmaniasis. You need, we need a vaccine. We've got uh, drugs which are not very good. We have diagnostics, the risk surveillance. The thing that really does not exist uh, but is you know coming closer is a vaccine. So, so I'll talk about the efforts um, that we've been doing in, in, in vaccine development using this this approach. So again, you have to develop collaboration. So so this is work that's been done by Hira Nakasi. This is not our work. This is Hira's work, uh, which he's been doing for over ten years now. And what he's been doing is developing attenuated strains. Uh, 
um, which when you give to an animal provides an immune response, and that immune response is protected against infection. So it's an attenuated uh, vaccine that, that the Nikasi lab has been developing, and he's done it by knocking out the centrin gene. So when you knock out the centrin gene from Leishmania donovani, donovani does not cause disease when it loses that centrin gene, but it does induce an immune response. And he's done experiments in mice, in hamsters, and in dogs showing that when you knock out the centrin gene, uh, you have an attenuated strain. <clears throat> so uh, Hira contacted us and said, look, let's collaborate on this. So it's, it's it, again, collaborations are key. So I, 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 you have to maintain uh, collaborations and, uh, with people in the field. But the thing is, um, Hira had already knocked out the Centrin gene, and, and, and there is a technology for doing gene knockouts before CRISPR. Uh, that's by gene replacement. And what, what Hira did was to replace the Centrin gene with antibiotic resistant genes here. So there's two copies. So he replaced the Centrin gene with a bleomycin gene and a hydromycin gene. So this is the parasite that Hira made. It's a knockout. It's lost the Centrin gene. It has the antibiotic resistant gene. But Hira could not move this into clinical trials because it has these antibiotic resistant genes here. You can't inject somebody with a organism that has antibiotic resistant genes. That's just not, that will not go through regulatory approval. So Hira had done a lot of work, but he, he could not go forward. He, he had to stop because he had these antibiotic resistant genes in his parasite. So what, what we did in this collaboration is to work with Hira to again make a centrin knockout, but without using the antibiotic resistance genes. And so what we the, the collaboration we did was to use a guide RNA to remove the uh, centrin gene uh, and then patch it together without antibiotic resistant genes. Now that would allow the parasite to move to clinical trials because this one cannot go to clinical trials. This one we're hoping will go to clinical trials. So we're at, at that stage now. So let me just go a little bit more detail about how this was done. Uh, so this is the centrin gene here in red. Uh, this is uh, the, the chromosome, uh, and you, when we in my laboratory de design guide RNA, so this is a guide RNA target here and a guide RNA target here, so the idea would to go in to cut here and cut here. So just remove this piece of DNA from the genome without removing anything else and not putting an antibiotic resistant gene, just remove that. So that was the plan. Uh, so what? This again is the plasmid here, and in fact, when we designed the plasmid with two different guide RNAs, one that cuts here, one that cuts here, so you slice out this piece here, you add the piece of DNA donor here to patch it back together again, uh, and then you could determine by PCR uh, whether or not this piece of DNA has, has, has been removed, and so that's the PCR here. But there's a problem, right? Technically, there's a problem. The problem was this. When you cut out the DNA and, and you patch it back together, you've got a culture. And in that culture, you have millions of parasites, right? Efficiency. And in that and efficiency, exactly. It's not happening in all the parasites. It's happening in some. Most of them still have the gene. So how do you, how do you find that parasite that has lost the gene? So you, it's like a needle in a haystack. How do you find the right one? You've got a culture. Pardon? I'm going to get some more water. Pardon? Yeah. yeah, you need some selection. Well, let, 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 let me go, let, let, let me tell you what we did. Um, Hira had shown that when you cut out the centrin gene, those parasites survive, but they grow sl slower than wild-type parasites. So they actually grow slower. They still grow, but slower than, than wild-type. So that's a phenotypic change. So, so what we did is we did single-cell cloning. So we had 96 well plates, and we took individual parasites, and we put it into many 96 well plates, and we left it for uh, two weeks, and then we looked at the plate, and we looked at the ones that had few parasites. So most, of the, most of the wells had a lot of parasites. Some had only a smaller number of parasites. So we selected the slow-growing parasites, grew them up, and then redid the uh, PCR. 
And in this way, we could identify those, uh, those parasites which actually had lost the gene. And it actually worked. Uh, the slow-growing parasites had lost the gene, and the normal parasites contained the gene. So that was a way of identifying the, uh, the ones with the centrin knockout. But we still had a problem. What, what was that problem? Again, we, we want to have an antibiotic resi resistance-free parasite. We don't want any antibiotic resistant genes. But this plasmid has two antibiotic resistant genes. It's got the neomycin resistant gene and it's got the ampicillin resistant gene. And so the plasmid is, is in the parasite. You, see, you can't use this parasite, you can't use this either because it's got antibiotic resistant genes. So what, what, do you do, what do you do about that problem? Sorry, why uh, didn't we use the antibiotic uh, resistance genes for selection? Oh, because if you do it for selection, well, well, you do use it for selection to, make, to select for those parasites that have the, uh, the plasma. Yeah. Okay. So you still got, you got to get rid of this plasma. And in fact, it is grown in G418, so I should have gone in, uh, because that selects for parasites with, with plasma. Well, actually, it's not that difficult. What, what, pardon? It's just in the plasmid. Yeah, it's just in the plasmid you have the, these antibiotic resistant gene, ampicillin resistance to grow in bacteria, neomycin resistance to select in Leishmania, and you've knocked out the, the centrin gene, but the, the parasite still has this plasmid, which has antibiotic resistant gene. It can't go forward to, to, to trials because it's got the, it's got the antibiotic resistant gene. It doesn't need it, no. So then let's just get rid of it. But how do you get rid of it? Or how do you identify it? Pardon? Uh, no. Okay, so, so what was done is, is to, is to do, again, go back to uh, single cell cloning, individual cloning, and, and these were grown either, uh, and then duplicated, and one is grown in G418, um, the anti which, which gives uh, protection if you have the presence of the plasma and, and, and in G418 free media, and, and select those clones that could no longer survive in the presence of the antibiotic. So if they can't survive in the presence of the antibiotic, it means it lost the plasma. So we selected clones that had lost the plasma because it can't survive, and then we just isolated it from the, from, from the others, from the duplicate culture. So this way we had lost, we, we had removed the, the plasma. So now we had removed the gene, we removed the plasma, now we've got the parasite that we're quite interested in. Uh, and when you put it into a, a Balp C mouse and you look at survival, uh, you can see the wild type. And in fact, we did this in L major, we didn't do it in L dominant. Uh, so L major causes the lesion, the wild type, but when you knock out the centrin gene, there's no lesion at all, so it's got the right phenotype, it's not causing any uh, uh, lesion in the Balp C mouse. Uh, and when you sequence across uh, the gene, so these are, are reads across the gene. In fact, these are two different clones. In fact, there's, four, there's, there's, there's five centrin genes, all slightly different, and the one that's been removed is shown here. You can see there are no reads here. Uh, it's, it's cut out, but the other centrin genes are present, which are present on other chromosomes, uh, so it's been, it's been removed. And then when we sequence the whole genome, to see if, if any other genes were gone, if, just to make sure that it's only the centrin gene that was gone. So this is uh, sequencing across the genome. So th this is a, it's a blue line, but in fact these are made of dots, and each dot is, a, is an individual gene. And you can see the gene coverage is 100% for, for starting from chromosome 1 to chromosome 36, right across here. But this gene, is there's no coverage. It's 100% here, it's zero here. And this is the centrin gene that's been removed. Um, so that's the gene. So the, the rest of the genome is fine, but just the centrin gene is gone, and the, and the, the, the chromosome has been repaired. So this is a, basically, we call it a scarless parasite. It's, it's, it's a fantastic parasite because only the centrin gene is gone, every other gene is there, and it's got no antibiotic resistance. It's a really clean, clean Leishmania major uh, parasite. So uh, in summary, uh, you can use CRISPR to do gene editing, and there are many, there are other labs doing, uh, using CRISPR in, by other approaches than, than what we have. All of them work well. You can do a lot of research. You can do a lot of editing of the genome now that you couldn't do several years ago. Um, 
And it's the, the use of CRISPR is going to advance studies in gene function, pathogenesis, and virulence. It will be very effective in, in understanding. And it's a, a very good tool to be used together with genome analysis and genome sequencing. So you can combine these two tools to, to understand the parasite a lot better. And uh, hopefully this will help us in the development of a, of a vaccine as well. So uh, these are some of the people involved, particularly Wen Li Zhang, who, who's uh, been in my lab for many, many years, and he's the molecular biologist who put together the plasmid. Uh, we collaborate a lot with, with Peter uh, in the genome analysis. Um, Trilinda in Sri Lanka, you know, she's been a, a wonderful collaborator. Hira Nakasi uh, and Srinivas in, in the at the FDA, Abbey. And we're doing a lot of work with Jesus now as well, because again, you have to collaborate with the right laboratories. Jesus is a, an expert in sand fly transmission. We want to make sure that any vaccine that we develop is also protected to the sand fly as well. So it's important to always be collaborating with, 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 with really outstanding collaborators. So I've been really fortunate to work with uh, fantastic people around the world. And, um, We'll see where this takes us, but it's been a, it's been a really great journey uh, so far, so I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.